Hey Masters, listen, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for spending time here. I mean, there's a lot of things you could be doing with your time, yet you're here with my guests and with me and supporting the show. And our goal is just to bring massive, massive amounts of value to you, value that you can use in your business, value that you can use in your life, value to use everywhere. So that's our intention. Again, I just want to say thank you. I don't know if I do it enough. And listen, just really, really appreciate you. And if no one else has told you this today, you rock. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hey, what's up, Masters? Welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery Podcast. I don't know if you noticed, but we've been going twice a week now. So we're on Mondays and Thursdays, 8 a.m. So look forward to bringing those episodes for you to the next level. And we're going to start today with Mr. Christopher Croner from Sales Drive LLC. What's up, Chris? Hey, how are you, Mr. Hill? I am doing well, my friend. I'm doing really well. And I, I know you're out in uh, the Windy City, Chicago. Yes, beautiful Chicago where it is uh, sunny and 70 degrees here on this uh, beautiful April day. So we'll definitely take the positive energy from the sunshine when we look out the window from our, uh, our quarantined headquarters. Yeah, you guys are you guys are on the map too with uh, with quarantine cities, huh? You have a, mm-hmm. a lot of the the coronavirus going on, huh? Yeah, I think we're around number nine or so on the list. So yeah, it's on the rise. We're expected to likely crest over the next week or two, but then hopefully at that point we will have uh, at least uh, gone a substantial portion of the way toward flattening the curve, if you will. So yeah, we're looking forward to that. Yeah, no doubt. Well, yeah, I think we're all in this together, man. These are some crazy times. And, uh, and I just appreciate you, you know, taking some time to do this. And uh, I know you're a, you're a sales trainer. You, you also have a book uh, called Never Hire a uh, Bad Salesperson Again. I, when I saw your media person uh, reached out to me when I saw that title, I just said, got to get this guy on the show because <laughs> I have made that mistake so many times. But mm-hmm. before we get to you, I just want to acknowledge our sponsors, Masters. I want to bring you as much value as possible. So I'm going to be doing a webinar this Friday, the 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to be on finding the motivated clients during challenging times. One of the questions I get more than any is, hey, who do I contact now? What do I say? How should I be doing that? And those are the things we're going to cover in this webinar, the who, the how, the tools we're using, strategies, where we should be focusing. Those are all the things that we're going to be covering for free for all of you listeners to my podcast. So just go to David's Event. That's it. DavidsEvent.com. Register this Friday, 1 p.m. 17th. See you there. Uh, Vulcan7.com, guys, for all your data for your expired for sale by owners you want to call up your database you want to dial it you want a crm a calendar system everything's built in um we're in the house now anyway what a better time Uh, there is no better time i should say than to be calling and connecting with people and just getting in touch with those people and there's a great system to help you do that so special opportunity through our path to mastery podcast go to vulcan7.com forward slash path to mastery and get yourself the system the whole system for a month for only 49 bucks to check it out all right enough out of that chris how's it going my friend doing just fine doing just fine Awesome. Now, your, your weather there's got to be nice as well on the spring day, correct? Yeah, it's beautiful, man. It's, uh, I want to say it's mid-60s. It's, it's mm. amazing. Um, I've been trying to, I hate to say the word trying, but I've been trying to go for a run all day and I just keep, it's just so much is happening. It's funny, we're, we're all working remotely and virtually and you'd think we'd have more time, mm-hmm. but yet I, I just find myself stuck in front of this computer all day and it, I never run out of things to do. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> that's that high drive energy that, that we talk about. You know, when you have somebody particularly, we'll talk about this later, that's going to be successful, particularly as a salesperson, one of the characteristics they have is need for achievement. You know, the person who wants to do well just for the sake of doing well, who's constantly focused on setting that bar high, jumping over it, setting it higher again the next time. And again, when you have someone like that, oftentimes they're effective, not only as salespeople, but the research also shows as entrepreneurs. So when that person mm-hmm. is remote, 
they're constantly thinking about what else can they can they do? What else can they do to add Can't value? Stop. You don't you don't need if you're the sales manager, you don't need to, for example, watch over that person because they're managing themselves, if you will. So that's yeah. oftentimes the, exactly what we find. The person who's more remotely based that has those characteristics, they are just on, you know, almost twenty four seven. I love that, man. Uh, well, a little bit about you, Chris. Uh, you wrote the book, as we said, called Never Hire a Bad Salesperson Again. Um, you also uh, are a researcher, correct, in identifying, I don't know if, it, let me see if I'm saying it right, non-teachable personality traits. Exactly. In, in common top producers. Um, mm-hmm. That's certainly something we need to talk about. You mm-hmm. have a proprietary uh, test, uh, drive test, a sales assessment. Yes. An interview. And... Um, used for hiring hunter salespeople. Mm -hmm. And you have also helped more than a thousand companies worldwide to hire and develop top performing salespeople. So again, I think this is the third time I'll say this, but thank you for joining us, man. So why should our listeners be uh, listening to you today? Well, again, my focus again is on the characteristics, if you will, that do differentiate the highest performing hunter salespeople. Again, when we talk about the hunters, we're talking about the salespeople whose responsibility is to bring on new accounts one way or another. And we focus on that role incidentally, because that is the position, you probably won't be surprised, that most companies have the greatest degree of difficulty hiring for. Because of Mm -hmm. course, it's not unusual that sales candidates, as you may have seen, in particular, can oftentimes be very skillful at presenting themselves very well in the interview process. And of course, it's natural that anyone wants to make a positive first impression. But then sometimes, of course, six months down the road or a year down the road, that ends up being the best sale that sometimes the company ever sees out of them. So our focus is on, okay, what is it that truly differentiates the highest performers and how do you identify that? My PhD mm-hmm. is in clinical psychology. And then I did some re-specialization, if you will, in industrial organizational psychology. And so I, I sort of bring everything from the world of personality assessment to the table, as well as a bit of that clinical background when I help companies to do interviews. So again, I'm happy to share with you the best of what uh, we have learned over the years. Sales Drive officially started in 2005, but I've been doing the research since 2002. So it's all, all I eat, breathe, and sleep, and I'm happy to be of service in any way that I can. Uh, well, I love that. So let's just start off with what are some of those non-teachable traits that you are talking about? Let's, let's, let's see if we can identify some of those. Well, there are really three. And again, when you ask anyone, what is it that leads someone to be successful as a salesperson? They're going to give you all the classics, you know, things like, oh, the person needs, I don't know, the gift of gab. They need to be persuasive. They need to, uh, maybe they need to be or- organized, you know, all the classic things that people might associate with somebody who's successful in that role. But when you think about someone particularly who's going to be a hunter, who's going to have to pick up the phone, sometimes knock on a door, get that door or that phone slammed in their face, then knock on the next door with that much more certainty and passion and conviction, psychologically, Mm -hmm. that's a very special person. So when we looked at, we started out really doing two things. Number one, looking at all the research that had been published over the last, what, 80, almost 90 years now academically in terms of what is it that makes a great salesperson, as well as at the same time, looking at our own work, doing behavioral interviews with sales candidates, and then circling back with their managers thereafter to find out who really does become successful. We found consistent patterns over time. And yes, of course, persuasiveness is important. And of course, relationship skills are important. But again, as I mentioned above and beyond, those types of things by far are these three non-teachable characteristics. And again, the first one is the one we mentioned earlier, need for achievement. The person who wants to do well simply for the sake of doing well. So again, that person high in need for achievement, sort of like that uh, kid in school that just has to get an A, (coughs) that mentality. And oftentimes, again, sales managers, when they're hiring, they're not thinking necessarily about that in a salesperson. They're thinking about kind of the classics, but it's that person that that just has to do well for its own sake. They're constantly climbing that mountain, jumping over it, setting it higher again the next time. Again, that that characteristic is important not only for salespeople, but also for entrepreneurs. So particularly now, as you can imagine, when salespeople, especially as you indicated, are going to be working a little bit more remotely, that becomes even more important. So that's the first piece, need for achievement. So, second, so, that, so that in your mind is something that's not teachable? So you, mm. you don't, is, so it kind of, let's, let's dig a little deeper on that yep. right there because is it, when, the way I've always understood that is if somebody, somebody, that's somebody's drive, right? For essentially we're talking about a person's drive, right? Mm. Is, is that accurate or no? Am I off? Uh, that, that's a piece of drive, yes. And that's a question I'll often get, for example, um, after I give a presentation. You know, what about my kids? You know, what, what is it that leads someone to having that characteristic? And when I say it's non-teachable, it's non-teachable past the age of about 21, 22. So as someone is growing up, certainly you can help to develop a characteristic like that. And there's really two things that go into it. There's nature and nurture. 
So on the nature side, there's the way the person is naturally wired, if you will, at birth. There's um, one, of, one of the uh, the big five personality characteristics that psychologists use to describe people is conscientiousness. And there's a piece of that conscientiousness called achievement striving. And that's something that's very much wired into someone at birth, if you will. They kind of, again, that kid that just has to get an A or has to be, uh, they have to do the best in, in their band, if you will. They love to watch their brothers and sisters. So that's one piece of it. That's the way they're wired. Okay. But then it's how they're raised one way or the other as, as they're growing up. And the key thing is how they are held accountable for their behavior. The person who ends up having a high need for achievement as they grow up in some way, they're held accountable for their behavior. So as I mentioned, that could be grades in school. It could be how they're, they deal with their brothers and sisters. Maybe they need to watch them, if you will. It could be their performance uh, on a team. It could be their performance in a band, many different areas. But those two things combined by the time, again, the person's in their late teens, early 20s, the natural hardwiring of having that need for achievement along with how they are raised, that leads to that person having that characteristic by the time they're so, in their So this is, so what we're talking about is different than for instance, somebody's, I guess, why, right? We, we talk a lot of, we, we hear about that all the time. Somebody's mm-hmm. why is what's going to drive them to be successful. But this, you're saying this is more of an, uh, an inherent trait that's like somebody's just like persistent, right? Is that, is that yes. what you're talking about? Or? Similar, yeah. So just, this is the, the first of the three characteristics, but you're, so you're exactly right. It, it leads a lot to what gives the person their, their why. It leads to them needing that why, if you, if you will. Because a person can have many different whys. It could be they're, they're, they want to do well for its own sake. They have just this mm. passion for excellence. The, the, another person's why could be their, their daughter or their son that they want to do well for. Another per- person's why could be they want to make a mark in the world one way or another. But it's that need for achievement that leads them to seek and find that why, if you will. Uh, so, all right. I love that. So I want to stay on this for a little bit longer sure. too. So, I, so I, I've hired a lot of people. Uh, you know, I've been 17 years in real estate, had top producing teams, been in recruiting, uh, and and I, you, you some pe you know, there's people that you know they'll show up for work, and you know they'll put in the effort, and then as soon as as soon as they go home, like in real estate, you're pretty much I hate to say you're always on, but in the beginning you're you're always on. You gotta you gotta shut it off, right? Because people call on you at night, people call on you in the morning, people call on the weekends. I I mean I mean some people they say they'll come in and say I want to make two hundred fifty thousand dollars next year, but then on weekends, they're not answering their phones or they're, uh-huh. they're sitting on the couch, you know, watching TV instead of uh-huh. dealing with buyer leads and stuff. So yep. how, is, is that like, is like, so for me, I can't do that. I'm always on, man. Like I told you, I, I'm from seven to seven. Is that, is that, <laughs> do I have this, <laughs> this, uh, this trait or this characteristic where some people, like some people I'm trying to, I'm thinking back to like when I was a kid, I think I had this too as a kid. Oh yeah. You no, know, I boxed. I did all the things. I always want to be the best. Yep. Right. Yep. And it very much relates. So you allude to a question people will often ask. Well, what about money motivation? I want a salesperson who's motivated by money. Well, the challenge that many companies will get into is they'll get somebody that they'll say is motivated by money, but that person tends to, to oftentimes, if money's their only motivation, they get up to a certain level of production, as you can imagine, and then they just level off. Mm. You're left asking, wait a minute. I've seen this person sell before. I know they have what it takes what happened? Why are they just phoning in the same performance quarter after quarter? And it's funny in that same conversation, I'll then ask that sales manager or that business owner, well, what do you look for in sales candidates? They'll say, well, I look for somebody with, um, I guess they themselves have a mortgage or a car payment or kids in school or these external things that are motivating them. And yes, those external pressures can be very motivating. But the key question then is David, what happens when those pressures are as they inevitably will be relieved? Now, again, the person knows at that point what they need to kind of phone in, if you will, quarter after quarter just to maintain, whereas the person motivated by need for achievement will continue to excel. They'll continue to produce. Money's still important to them, but they look at money, for example, the same way that a great athlete looks at points on the scoreboard. It's how they show how well they've done rather than their goal in and of itself, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it does. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if when they hit their financial goal or, or their thermostat, I guess mm-hmm. they're going to keep going. They're not going to stop because, right. Oh, well, I've, I've, I've hit my, because it's more than it's more, it's about more than the money is what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Right. That's why they're, they're on all weekend long. Again, that's not just about money. It's about excellence. Money comes through as a result of that. And that's how they show how well they've done. It's like, again, points on the scoreboard to a great athlete. So that's the first of the three elements of drive, need for achievement. So let me ask you this question. I know I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm probably slowing you down. No, no. I, so the thing, I want you to think about like, 
I said 250,000. Most people don't say they want to make 250,000 when I meet with them. Most say, I want to make 100,000. Mm-hmm. And if you ask them why they want to make 100,000, they have no idea. Most people, most real estate agents right? mm-hmm. in our industry, you know, and, and the reality is, I think the average agent sells six houses a year. So they're not making $100,000, right? You mm-hmm. have a huge industry. But, but I guess my point is, um, nine out of 10 people that will sit in front of me and say, this is what I want to make, aren't willing to put in the effort to do that. Mm-hmm. Why not? What's missing? <laughs> well, there's, there's a couple things. First, the situation that you're talking about, you know, it's backing up a little bit is oftentimes as I'll just ask to be sure it's an interview situation, correct? Where you're interviewing the person. Yeah. As a- interviewing. Oh. Yeah. It's typically an in-person interview, maybe mm-hmm. a, a, you know, nowadays, obviously a zoom, but sure. yeah. Sure. Yep. So again, when the person's in the interview, it's almost in many cases, unfortunately, almost a different person that, that you're, you're seeing in that particular case. You know, they're thinking in their mind, what do I need to say? What words can I use that will get me my, get my objective accomplished? You know, I want to get, the, get this job. What do I think this person want, wants to hear? And so they're going to want to present themselves, say whatever number, often, oftentimes, unfortunately, they think will, will sound good. And then you're left scratching your head after that, thinking, wait a minute. You know, this person had, you know, all these tremendous goals that they gave mm. to me during this interview. Where's this person now? You know, what happened? <laughs> where, where, where are they doing all the things that they said that they were going to do? Well, again, in the interview process, again, oftentimes, unfortunately, uh, salespeople can be very, very skillful at presenting themselves as they wish to be seen. Uh, but the key question is, underneath the surface, do they really have the passion to execute on those promises? And that's what we specialize in doing is determining whether the person really has that wiring, if you will. Yeah, I love that. All right, so let's jump forward. I need to get better at the interview process is what I'm hearing. So, so <laughs> I'm happy to I help. Think, all right, well, I appreciate that. All right, so, what, so let's talk about the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second piece is competitiveness. And the competitive mm-hmm. salesperson we find really wants to do two things. Number one, we find they want to, again, as we kind of discussed, they want to be the best among their peers. So they want to make sure that of the team that they're on, they're number one, if you will. But then number two, they want to win that client or that customer over to their point of view. Because to them, uh, psychologically, that sale becomes kind of like a contest of wills. So that's the second piece, competitiveness. And then the third piece is optimism. And that's the salesperson's sense of certainty that they will succeed, as well as, of course, their resiliency to hang in there when they face the inevitable rejection that a salesperson just has to deal with. So we find it's those three characteristics then all together, need for Mm. achievement, competitiveness, and optimism that psychologically uh, creates sort of the perfect storm, if you will. And collectively, we refer to those three characteristics as drive. So do you ever see uh, performing salespeople that are missing one of these? I, I would imagine it's, you're not going to do anything if you're missing two, but you, are some people <laughs> good moderately question. successful missing one of the three? Or? Very good question. So um, a, a related question people will all often ask as well is, do we weight the three elements of drive differently? And yes, we do. So for example, we have the highest weight on need for achievement. We find that is you know, the most important of the three, second highest on competitiveness, and third highest on optimism, because we do find that there are occasionally some people for whom optimism isn't quite as strong, but their need for achievement and competitiveness are so strong, they'll just push themselves mm. to do whatever it is that they need to do to be successful. Think of someone who maybe doesn't necessarily enjoy cold calling, but they just have to win. You know, they'll push themselves psychologically through it because, again, their desire to achieve and their desire to compete overcome any reticence that they may have. So if I were to afford the person the opportunity to be low or or maybe a little bit more moderate on one of the three characteristics, it'd probably be optimism. But optimism is certainly helpful, as you can imagine, particularly in the the environment uh, that we're in now. We really the person that's going to be able to bounce back and for whom on even their darkest day, they just know they're going to be successful, if you will. Masters, I want to bring you as much value as possible. So I'm going to be doing a webinar this Friday, the 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to be on finding the motivated clients during challenging times. One of the questions I get more than any is, hey, who do I contact now? What do I say How should I be doing that? And those are the things we're going to cover in this webinar. The who, the how, the tools we're using, strategies, where we should be focusing. Those are all the things that we're going to be covering for free for all of you listeners to my podcast. So just go to David's event. That's it. 
davidsevent.com. Register this Friday, 1 p.m. 17th. See you there. That's an internal optimism, correct? You have to have an internal optimism before you can have an external, right? Exactly. And again, it's yeah. one of those things that's that's hardwired, you know, a combination of the way the person's wired at birth along with the way that they're raised. So in terms of, say, building optimism, one of the classic examples that's given is imagine you have um, your kid is stuck in a, in a tree. And so the natural instinct as a parent is to say, okay, I'm going to go grab the kid out of this tree and, oh, thank goodness you're safe. Whereas to take another approach where the parent just gently coaxes the child down the tree. And when the child comes, comes down, they're, they're safe on the ground saying, I knew you could do it. You know, so it's the combination of the way the person's naturally wired with those experiences as they grow up. That characteristic is, again, relatively solidified by the time the person's in their, say, late teens, early 20s. Interesting. All right. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that does make sense. Um, so how do you – so let's talk about your process for, for finding out if these things are missing or if, if – if so what does that look like? Mm-hmm. So in terms of our assessment. Yeah. Uh, sure. It's an online assessment with questions that the candidate answers – to determine whether or not they have, again, those three elements of drive that we discussed, as well as, again, other core skills that, as as I mentioned, are still important, things that are more teachable, things like, again, persuasiveness and relationship skills and organizational skills. So it's all about, as you can imagine, asking the right questions on the assessment. And so one of the questions we'll often get is, well, can someone fake an assessment like that? Could a candidate just sit down and say, okay, you know, well, it's obvious, you know, it's obvious what the assessment is going for. Could they just fake their way through it? And unfortunately, that tends to be the case with many of the assessments available. They tend to be just a little bit too easy. So for example, if I'm a candidate and I see a question that says, I'm very persuasive, rate this from one to five, and I want the job, what am I going to say? You know, (laughs) I'm a four or five. Uh, So what you want to do to eliminate that problem is use a different question format. Our test, the drive test, uses a question format called forced choice, which is designed to eliminate faking. So the way a forced choice question works is for each question, the person gets a series of three statements, all of which will be worded very positively. So a question, for example, may say something like, uh, I consider myself a leader. I have strong persuasive skills. I'm very organized. Okay. Now, which of these is most like you and which is least like you? So obviously that forces the candidate to make some very difficult Mm. distinctions, but then it gives us a much better sense of their real priorities. And of course, as they're working their way through that assessment, we're constantly monitoring their consistency as they respond to those questions. Because again, as you can probably imagine, if they do try to fake the test, it's going to be very difficult for them to remember consistently what they ranked most and least across the entire assessment. So again, it's designed to be very robust for our clients. All right. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, we, I, I, I've been at Keller Williams for a long time and uh, mm-hmm. we've used, we used to use the DISC assessment. Are you familiar with the DISC? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, it's similar, right? Mm-hmm. And then there was, uh, we had the AVA. Are you familiar with the AVA? The AVA. I'm not as familiar with that one, no. That's, a, that's another assessment. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly what it stands for. We're not using it anymore anyway, but similar. It would be mm-hmm. very similar questions to the types of questions you asked and they'd mm-hmm. have to pick. And then I think it's probably looking for patterns, right? Like, In many cases, yeah, yes. And again, we're specialized. That's a great question in terms of, say, DISC and the other tests out there. We're specialized sure. in sales. So just looking for that salesperson, particularly, again, that hunter salesperson, because that is the, the most the challenging hunter. role for most companies, particularly as we move into. So, what, so the, let's, uh, let's clarify hunter. When you, when you say hunter, what's different about a hunter than another salesperson? Good question. So when, when we say hunter salesperson, we're talking about the person who's responsible for new account acquisition one way or the other. Mm. They're going out bringing on okay. new business as opposed to what we would describe as a farmer or someone who's focused a little bit more now on maintenance. And both are critical, sure. both are essential. But we find that that characteristic that's particularly important, again, on the hunter side, that drive characteristic where the person's kind of, again, they've got that natural desire you know, to, to be able to handle the situation where the person gets gets on the phone, that client or that prospect slams that phone down or that slams the door in their face. They don't get turned off by that. They know that, okay, the next one's going to go well. So they, they, they march yeah. right to their next call. You know, they bounce right back psychologically. That's a very special person. And that's why we really take the time to go after that person again in a very precise way. Don't you think that would come from conditioning? I mean, cause that I, I that's me, but I, I mean, I've been, Mm-hmm. Been do, I've been on the phone since I was 17, it, yep. you know, call centers. So I've kind of, I guess I've kind of built up a tolerance mm-hmm. to that, right? Is that, because I, I, yep. I don't know that, was that there before? I don't, I, I don't know the end. It may have been and I just didn't know it. 
No, that's a very good point. Uh, in terms of conditioning, think of the person like in, in the movie Boiler Room, if you will, kind of the ultimate, you know, they're, they're, on, they're on the phone, they're dealing with, with rejection. Uh, yes, of course, conditioning can be very helpful in that regard, particularly to build a person's confidence, of course. But again, you can have somebody that, as you can imagine, you could, you could have a salesperson that's very well conditioned, that doesn't mind necessarily getting rejected. But if their need for achievement, for example, is low, you know, the person that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they may say that they have strong goals and things of that nature, but they don't have necessarily the passion that, that you're, you're looking for. They don't have that desire underneath the surface. Yeah, they may be able to handle a rejection, but the key question is, yeah. are they going to be able to do that on a consistent basis? Are they going to push themselves sure. to get up early and stay up late? And that's what we're really looking for in this case. That's, that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, let, let me, so you mentioned a farmer um, mm-hmm. in, in, the, in the hunter. Um, do you ever see them being the same person or are they two separate people? Good question. Um, oftentimes, they're the two separate people, but they can certainly be the same person. Uh, some companies, for example, when they're just starting, they need somebody who's going to be able to do both, somebody who can bring an account on board and then deal with them effectively thereafter, make sure that they stay on board. So yes, you can certainly have one person who is good in both of those areas, keeping in mind that, again, what typically leads to someone being successful on the farming side or the account management side are skills like relationship skills and organizational skills. And those are important, but we can build those if we have to. We can teach those. So I would typically rather, if I need a person who's going to need to do both. I would typically want to focus on hiring for that non-teachable drive sure. piece and keep in mind that if I need to, I can build relationship skills. I can help them develop that. I can help them develop their, their detail orientation, if you will, but I can't change drive past 21, 22. Got it. Okay. And, and yeah, I like interviewing you because you say good question. <laughs> That's, um, so, but listen, so I, 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 part of it was a leading question. I mean, I, I feel like they are it's different people like somebody that's really really good at nurturing mm-hmm. may not be the greatest hunter right? at least from from my experience <laughs> cases. like Maybe. i i can nurture but i have to really work at it i'm more mm-hmm. of a hunter mm-hmm. no right? exactly exactly so it, it's easier though to take someone if you have to if you have to to take someone that's a natural hunter and help them to build relationship skills than to go the other way around. Take somebody that, again, is a great customer service person, for example, and try to give them that, that drive, need for achievement, mm. competitiveness, and optimism. It's not going to work. So oftentimes, if you do, if a company is in a situation where they have to have somebody who does both, ideally, they could absolutely split up those responsibilities, but they do need someone who's going to do both. It's best to hire for the non-teachable things, keeping in mind the things that we can develop if we have to. I love it. That's good. That's a that's a great point. All right. So right now, obviously, everybody's is is working with these stay at home orders and you know Zoom meetings and all this other stuff. How's that affecting uh, you know the salespeople right now? What are some of, what are some of the tips you're giving uh, your you know people working virtually and stuff? Yeah, of course. So there's really there there's two sides of it. One of the questions we'll get is does that change in some ways the characteristics? that we're looking for in candidates. And it doesn't change the characteristics, it really just amplifies them. So as I mentioned, you know, that need for achievement piece when it comes to the elements of drive is important for salespeople as well as entrepreneurs. People to kind of get up every morning and they just have to make it happen. There's nobody watching them. Mm. That now more than ever is critical because now you can't necessarily watch that person, you know, all the time, 24 seven. So finding the individual that has naturally that non-teachable need to achieve, who is, as we alluded to at the beginning of our call, always on, they're on from seven, to seven and they're not doing that because they're forced to do it they love to do it so on the hiring side that's certainly important then in terms of say hiring managers as things have changed now right now it could in many ways be a golden opportunity because never will you have uh in and again going going forward at least between now and when the, the majority of this issue eases we have a situation where so many eyeballs are on their computer screen so you have a, a golden opportunity now to, to resource and source candidates people who again maybe you wouldn't been able, have been able to reach uh under other circumstances and attract them if you need to attract them so it's mm-hmm. there's a little bit of an opportunity in this situation if you can recognize it yeah <laughs> do you think uh, do you think uh, we uh people love doing it or they they can't they can't help it <laughs> it's, it's, you know <laughs> well, I, I that's how i feel like myself sometimes like i i don't know what i can't don't know what else to do like i'm gonna i'm just gonna keep going you know i'm gonna go spend some time with my kids too and i do that at night but mm-hmm. during the day like what else is it i can't watch tv i mean what else am i gonna do well, one of, the, one of the, the strongest motives of any human being is purpose. What gives that person a purpose? And when you have somebody who's high in drive, 
They have that need to achieve, that need to achieve element, that desire for achievement. That's their purpose. That's what they love to do deep, deep down. It makes them who they are. Because so if you're not doing that, you're, you're, not, you're not feeling like you're yourself, if you will. So that's why, again, that's why we look for candidates that naturally have that characteristic. Because as you can imagine, it, at, at the same time, in many cases, you, you could theoretically save someone from themselves. If you have someone who thinks they're going to be great at sales, who thinks they're going to enjoy going out and hunting over the phone or in person. And then again, they're dealing with that constant rejection, that constant need to constantly set the bar high, jump over it, set it higher again. And they don't like it because that's not mm. who they are. In many cases, you can identify, okay, this person is not really best for that role. Maybe they can be great at customer service, but let's bring in the people that naturally have that desire to achieve it, which is, of course, in their case, their purpose. That way, everyone is aligned with exactly what, what they're doing. And at the end of the day, yeah, they're going out you know, do, doing other things that, of course, give their life even more meaning. But for, from during that time, during, during the day, when they're, again, they're, they're out doing what, what they need to do to, to uh, satisfy their, their sense of purpose, it's all about achievement. That's what we look for. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest mistake that most people are making when hiring? Mm. I would say the biggest mistake um, is relying on gut instinct when they're hiring candidates. You know, and it's a very common mistake because oftentimes, you know, when people go through school, they don't get a, a course in how to hire sales candidates. So they don't know what things to look for. And even when you're hiring other positions, people don't necessarily have a, a, a crash course in how to interview effectively. So again, what, what the person will, will sit down and, and they'll do is they'll, they'll think to themselves, okay, what am I looking for in a salesperson? They have, again, they're a warm person. They're outgoing. They like people. I'll sit down and I'll, I'll see whether or not I like that person. And I'll just know, I'll have a gut instinct whether the person can sell effectively. That's probably the biggest mistake. And then time after time after time, they wonder, well, why is it that this person who looks so great in the, in the interview ended up underperforming again and again? Well, it's all about instead of using your gut, establishing a consistent scientific step-by-step -step process. And it's not that difficult to do. And that's what I really enjoy doing, you know, in terms of purpose. My purpose is in many cases on the teaching side. I love to teach. I love to help, again, our clients develop a consistent step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step process. That's the way I can best be of service is to show them, okay, here's, here's a process you can use. Start with your resume review. Start with a phone screen after that. Then move on to an assessment. Then you have three great pieces of data, as you can imagine, to decide, okay, number one, you bring the person into that, that Zoom interview or sometimes an in-person interview still. And number two, if you do, how do you structure the interview to make the best use of your, your time? And we give people guidance in terms of all of those steps. So let me ask you this question. How, so how much does, because when I mean, you think about gut, I, I get you, you, you have to have a, we have to have a process is what you're saying mm -hmm. of bringing people through, but there is part of it has, is gut too, right? How much, like, like how much would you say would weigh on that? Like, let's just say this person's, everything's, everything's going great. Mm -hmm this person uh, they they're nailing every assessment and every question and, and but then something's just like <laughs> i don't know about this right yeah, like the yeah. other side of it right yeah. like years ago a friend of mine who uh, who teaches stuff similar to, he's he's a recruiter mm -hmm. he says that I, I i i tend to fall in love with people mm -hmm. so i have to make sure that i'm not doing that right so this is kind of like the opposite of that right so mm -hmm. what okay. uh, i don't know, I forget what, yeah, so yeah, so there, there's the, the importance of gut instinct, and it is still a, a very important factor, if you will. So backing up a little bit, at the end of the day, what ultimately leads someone to be successful as a salesperson is all of the elements of what we might think of as the sales ecosystem. It's almost like sports. So fit with the company culture, fit with the management style, fit with the compensation plan, and of course, personality. All those things come together at the end of the day to ultimately determine how successful the person will be. The gut instinct element of the interview typically um, typically pertains to the cultural fit, the fit with the company culture. Do you mm. like this person? Do you connect with them, if you, if you will? And if there's that element of your gut instinct that's saying, you know, there's something about this person. I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's just something that just seems a little awry, if, if you will. Oftentimes, by the way, what you're seeing in a situation like that is something nonverbal. There's something that person's doing nonverbally that's cueing you in that there, there, there's, there's a misalignment between what you're hearing and what the truth is underneath the surface. So there are certain um, red flags that you can often look for in the interview process that can, that can clue you in to exactly what's behind that gut instinct or that feeling of, you know, there's something about this, this person. In fact, um, one of my, my mentors, uh, Neil Whitmer, developed a, a nice check checklist along with uh, his, um, his colleague, Jeff Grip. And I always will share this with, with our clients of things that you can look for in the interview when you're starting to get that feeling maybe halfway through the interview that there's something about this person. Concrete things that you can look for that you might have seen in the interview 
interview uh, that you might not have really processed or noticed and what those things can really mean. So whenever our clients or uh, companies that are reach, reaching out to us have questions about that, I'm always happy to send that type of a checklist to them. Awesome. All right. Great, man. Well, let me ask you this. Any, any questions that um, I should have asked that I didn't ask or what did, what, did I miss anything? Mm, that's one of my favorite questions. Um, you know, in terms of the, the process, not re- really. One of the questions we'll occasionally get is, is, is there a key interview question? that you can use, you know, not only just an assessment, but just one-on-one mm. with a candidate that can help to determine whether they have yeah, it's a good one. types of traits. And we know, of course, David, that the best predictor of future behavior is previous behavior. So during the interview, it's all about asking about consistent examples of things the person has done in the past, behaviors in which they've engaged, that allow, allow us to predict how they're going to perform for us because they reflect the characteristics that we're looking for. So for example, when it comes to need for achievement, one of my favorite questions is, what kinds of sacrifices have you had to make to be successful? What does that person consider to be a sacrifice? Was it maybe they had to work a couple weekends last year or was it something more substantial? Now compare that, of course, to the kinds of sacrifices you've seen your top performers have to make. Or tell me about the greatest goal you've ever accomplished professionally. Really have the candidate flesh that out for you. Then you can reflect back to them. You have to be proud of that. How do you intend to top it? Again, the person high in need for achievement has that plan to top it and they are excited about the opportunity to tell you about it. Or for optimism, tell me about a time when you remain persistent even though everyone else around you gave up. Now tell me about another time, you know, just giving those consistent examples, if you will. So again, if, uh, if, if your, your listeners have, have any questions, you know, regarding uh, those, those types of interview questions, I'm always happy to, uh, to give them guidance and share and be of service in any way I can. Uh, awesome, man. Well, hey, I, that's was super helpful. I appreciate it, man. Um, good stuff. Pleasure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, well, how do our audience, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? The best way is through our website, uh, salesdrive.info, S-A-L-E-S-D-R-I-V-E.info. If you want to put the, 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 the link in, in there, they can click on that. They can get a free assessment. They can test one of their people or a candidate. And if they do so, uh, I am always happy uh, to schedule a call with them personally. You know, For any of your listeners awesome. who would like a personal call with me to talk about the person who took that assessment to get you know my interpretation of how the candidate performed and my recommendation prior to proceed with them thereafter in the interview. Again, we work with over a thousand companies around the world and we're happy to, again, be of service in any way we can. That's excellent. All right, well, we really appreciate that. And you know, final, final t- question today is really, I mean, everybody listening to this today, if you could kind of uh, sar- summarize or now maybe say, what's the one thing that you really want everybody to walk away from this interview with today? Good question. Yeah, if there's one thing that I could leave you with in the, in the, uh, in the, the final analysis, if you will, is make sure that you're using some type of an assessment at the beginning of your interview process to narrow down your search for candidates. Because again, you end up wasting a lot of time, you know, interviewing people that don't have that high potential. Make sure you're starting out with an assessment that goes after, again, need for achievement, competitiveness, and optimism, those non-teachable traits. Because when you do that, when you're consistently, again, assessing and interviewing candidates well, it's almost like the NFL combine, if you will. You're taking that process step by step by step, and you're making sure that that becomes your legacy going forward, a high performance, high caliber team in any type of economic environment. Awesome. Well, hey, Chris, uh, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. And for our listeners, yeah, I would encourage everybody to reach out to Chris. I think he just offered you a, uh, a free phone call. So you may have a, a couple thousand calls, Chris, coming up. <laughs> um, so anyway, you guys can connect with Chris on his site. I uh, do. I just want to say, man, I appreciate you. And uh, man, I hope you, uh, uh, you know, stay safe. And, uh, you know, I know you're in Chicago. So I'll say a prayer for, for Chicago and you. And We'll pray for you guys as well. Stay safe as well, you. sir. Yeah. Thank you, man. Appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Take care. Masters. Hey, before you jump on to what's next, I just want to thank you for checking out the show. And if you like what you heard, please give me a review on iTunes. It helps tremendously. It helps us get guests. And it's, it's I just so appreciate it. Uh, and if you want, send me an email and I will read your review right here on the podcast email me david at davidihill.com again i want to thank you uh, check out our sponsors i appreciate our sponsors without them we can't do this vulcan7.com for your expired physicals all that stuff crm uh, vulcan7.com forward slash path 
to Mastery. Again, David's free book. Get yourself a free audiobook in health and nutrition, you know, is number one to me. Uh, so check out Advocare products, which are tremendous products. As a matter of fact, Patrick Mahomes uses the products. So go to LiveLongerSmarter.com. Again, LiveLongerSmarter.com to check out health and nutrition products. My friends, again, I appreciate you listening to the show. You rock.